Okay, well, uh, perhaps we can start. Um, we have uh, a, a good sized um, audience at the moment. Um, so uh, the Flyway Partnership Secretary would like to welcome you to uh, this, this webinar, which is uh, on the Migratory Waterbird Conservation Status Review, which Wetlands International uh, was commissioned by the Secretariat uh, to prepare uh, this conservation status review as one of the decisions from the last uh, meeting of partners. Um, Wetlands International has been uh, particularly Dr. Tej Munkor um, leading uh, the Wetlands International team to bring together uh, updated information uh, about the, the status of our water birds. Um, and in particular in this one, um, it's looked at uh, population level um, of rather than just the species, because we, we're working on a flyway initiative, we really need to be paying more attention to the populations of migratory water birds that, that we have in the flyway. Um, this is a, a, a really um, an advance, uh, a, a great advance forward on, on um, developing the population estimates. Uh, and this is critical for the partnership because we use the, the population estimates as one of the key criteria for uh, defining sites of international importance. So uh, I'd like to uh, pass to uh, Dr. Tej Munkar um, to really uh, tell us about the conservation status review. Tej. Doug, did you want a few comments from the technical subcommittee chair before we go to Tej? If you would like, yes, please. I'd be happy to. Um, Good morning, everybody. You probably all know me. If not, I'm Nick Davidson. I'm the current chair of the technical subcommittee of the partnership. Um, so it's good morning from the United Kingdom. Good evening to most of the rest of you. Um, I'm going to be very brief because we want to make sure we have as much time as possible for Tej and Tom to present the findings to us. This is an enormously important report for the Flyway Partnership. I cannot overestimate or underestimate that. It's also much needed and long overdue because if we don't know what the status is of the populations we are working to conserve, then we can't plan and implement actions appropriately to conserve them. We also have known for some time that the East Asia Australasia flyway information on populations of water birds is probably been the worst of any flyway. A lot of the population estimates have been very out of date, some of them decades or several decades out of date. Now that's a problem because we also know from many sources that many of the water bird populations on the flyway are in trouble and populations are declining. This means that if we try and apply the information we have on population sizes and particularly the derived 1% population thresholds, then we are not actually acting on what the current situation is. And 1% thresholds derived from the population estimates um, are very important indeed for the implementation of the Flyway Partnership and also for the Ramsar Convention, particularly in relation to Ramsar's Criterion 6, which is populations of more than 1% of a flyway population at a site for designation of a flyway network site or a Ramsar site. Now the implication is that if population sizes have changed and particularly decreased, then we are missing the international importance of some of these populations at particular sites. And so this update of the conservation status review is critically important for our correct application of designation of, of internationally important sites and I can't underestimate how important that is for all our work and I just want to congratulate Tej and Tom for what has been a gargantuan piece of work to achieve and deliver. It is hard to underestimate how much work has gone in behind the scenes to actually pull all of this together and I'm extremely grateful to all those members of the Flyway Network who've helped contribute their knowledge and information to help improve this. We can always do better, 
But this is the first conservation status review. And so it's doing as much as it can to deliver current knowledge and expertise to these uh, to our information on populations. Um, but we mustn't drop the ball having congratulated ourselves on achieving this first conservation status review, because we will need to look forwards um, to a program of updating in the future cycles. So I recognize Tej and Tom for a spectacularly important piece of work for us. I don't know whether they've actually managed to get any sleep in the last year pulling all of this together, but it, please don't underestimate how much effort and importance goes into this. So I'm going to hand over to back to Doug and let's hear from Tej and Tom what they've achieved and what it means for all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nick, for those uh, important comments and giving a greater context to the conservation status review. So over to you, Tej. Thank you very much, uh, Doug, and thank you very much, Nick, for those warm words of introduction and also of appreciation. I think it's really appreciation that goes out to people around the world and particularly in this flyway who have contributed their information to this report. We greatly appreciate that um, the Flyway Partnership Secretariat and the Norwegian Agency have provided the resources that are needed to allow us to bring together this report over the last year. And uh, it's our pleasure for Tom and myself to be making a presentation today of the report that was sent out in March. This work has been coordinated with the uh, Flyway Secretariat, particularly Dr. Ching Zheng of the Science Unit. And we greatly appreciate all the effort across the Secretariat in helping support this report, the Technical Subcommittee and its members, and everyone who has participated. So let's jump into the report. Um, I hope you can see my second slide. Yes. Um, just to give you a feel for the presentation today, uh, we, I'll give you a little background, uh, some about, uh, something about the timeline about this project. We summarize the results. We look at the gaps and the recommendations for the next CSR. So in terms of background, I think you've heard from Nick and from Doug about the importance of this work and really the uh, this slide may be superfluous in that sense, but just to, just to be clear about what we're talking about, the 1% populations are strictly uh, dependent on good information, up-to-date information for designating and managing flyway network sites. It also helps to prioritize sites and species, as well as the threatened populations. We will talk more about threatened populations later. It provides us a basis for implementation of activities at national level and at flyway level to conserve these populations. And finally, I guess it helps to me measure the success of the partnership because the partnership is one that has a goal which says that migratory birds in the flyway are recognized and conserved for the benefit of people and biodiversity. We have a process within the partnership that records and prioritizes actions and these are through the meetings of the partners and in decision 7.4 uh, several years ago the partnership called for the use of the water bird population estimates process to provide up-to-date information on population sizes and trends and to provide the basis for deriving the one percents. <clears throat> The latest strategic plan of the partnership, which really guides all the work that the partnership aims to promote and achieve during the 2019-2028 period, within one area of its work, within key area 3.2, states that conservation status reviews for waterbirds should be periodically produced, going back to what uh, Nick said, that we need to have updated information on this, and that <clears throat> We should ideally have two updates produced over the course of 10 years. This is what the strategic plan called for. 
it then identifies that this work is done really in collaboration with everyone, by the partners, Wetlands International and the technical committee, working with relevant working groups, um, task forces, as well as research institutions that have information. Moving forward, uh, at the last meeting of parties, uh, partners, sorry, um, we had a paper presented jointly by WWT and Wetlands International calling for the development of this uh, conservation status review. And the uh, decision has five elements. One that um, <clears throat> the partnership should maintain an up-to-date information base trends and 1% and produce a periodic uh, conservation status review. It calls for this to be happening on a regular basis. It calls for Wetlands International to work with everyone to produce it. You see that the first edition should have been produced by 2019, but this did not happen because of the lack of um, resources. So we are very glad that the resources were finally produced and we were able to work with everyone to do so. It fourthly, it calls on this to be feeding not just into the region, but into the global updates because many of these populations cross the Pacific and into the Central Asian flyway. So the East Asian Australasian flyway is not a standalone, it's part of the global flyway, uh, flyway system of birds. And finally, it calls on the monitoring task force to develop standardized guidance for development and implementation of comprehensive monitoring programs in countries. And I'll come back to this in the recommendations. So with this decision, um, <coughs> the partnership currently at the end of the uh, CSR1 has 276 populations of water birds across these different families. And in this uh, image, you can also see where the partnership has working groups or task forces that cover these populations and species. This first CSR is not including the populations of uh, the more uh, marine species or offshore species, which are still to be defined. And we expect that these would be covered in future CSRs because they are uh, now in an integral part of the partnerships work. <clears throat> but with 276 populations, we've had uh, our work cut out for us already this time. So we hope that uh, this provides a good basis for future work. This provides you the final timeline of the report production and the consultation process. So last year, we started with the Secretariat organizing in April uh, a meeting a webinar where we introduced the plan and we had a lot of feedback at that where uh, we then provided documents and drafts for consultation. This consultation was extended by a month uh, in response to feedback from the partners and experts that they would like more time. So that was an extended uh, consultation period. Uh, besides the uh, consultation on size estimates and trends, we also continued with the consultation on production of the maps for all the populations. After that, we worked to bring together that information. And in the first quarter of this year, uh, Ching has circulated this to all of you. We've made that information available on the website. And we now are at this webinar in point six, which is to present the final results. In terms of process, um, I see this is, this is slipped off the page, but the aim is that we will have the final review and approval by the technical subcommittee of the report and sign off by the management committee. And we expect by the end of June, which is the second quarter, we would have available on the Waterbird Populations Portal the uh, latest information so that it's publicly accessible and usable by partners um, for conservation action. And unfortunately, as the 
uh, with COVID, the meeting of partners, uh, which was going to be this year, has been pushed to next year. We will have a report and a, a decision paper to the next MOP about the CSR process that allows the partnership to continue producing these uh, documents into the future, building on the work that was approved this year. <clears throat> To give you a feel of what the report looks like, I've put the table of contents. So it's quite simple. You can see um, that this summary report is divided into seven parts. And it importantly, it contains eight annexes. Uh, the most important annexes, presumably for most people, are the annexes three, which is the size and trends estimate, but this is linked to our website. So you can in future go online to access this information. It provides in, uh, a list of populations for which there is only best guess estimates because we are really, as uh, Nick mentioned in the introduction, uh, are, a pop, are a flyway with a very variable quality of information. That leads then into the annex for which there is trends for which there is idea, no idea or poor trend quality uh, estimates. Importantly, Annex 6 provides you the list of the latest draft 1% and 0.25% thresholds. The 0.25% thresholds are important for uh, this, uh, the flyway site network criteria that deal with designating sites of importance based on populations on their migration. Finally, it provides a list of all the population boundaries and the background work that uh, goes to support that. And the last annex that we added was a list of species. So you can see that we are working in this, um, in this partnership at the population level, but it's also useful to reference the species. So that I hope provides you a basis for understanding how the report is structured. And importantly, that the report is only a summary report. The summary report feeds into two major processes in the consultation process. And one has been about the estimates and trends. And this information is now available in the uh, in the new portal, well, new in the sense it was launched in June last year. And in this portal, after you log in, you can access the information for the partnership and all the draft populations. And for example, the Northern Pintail, the population of the partnership, it shows you that it belongs to this partnership. What is the range? It provides you information on the population size. So here you can see it's draft because it's still not approved, finalized, and it provides notes and references. As an, as an example here, it provides a reference for which we've <clears throat> used the information through the long-term monitoring work that was done in Hong Kong. It provides you uh, information on the minimum and maximum uh, population estimates and an estimate uh, quality indicator. You can also then see all the information for the previous uh, water bird population estimate uh, uh, reports in the same page. Secondly, below this, it gives you information on the population trends. Again, it has notes and references. And here in references, it provides you detailed information on how the, no, uh, how the uh, trend has been calculated and uh, references to that information as well. You can see here, it provides the start year and end year and a trend uh, indication. It provides you a quality indicator as well uh, to, give you an, to give you an understanding of how good that information is at the population level. And it then provides the 1% uh, level. And you can see that that's really been unchanged for this population since the last review in 2012. It provides at the end of the page, all the references and notes for that population. So there's a lot of information packed together on this page per population. And if you've not had a chance to look at this, 
I encourage you to look at this after this um, after this uh, webinar because when you look at our report, the report is really a condensed summary of this, and a lot of this detail is hidden behind in this database. Secondly, during the consultation process, we have made available a, po a portal for all the draft population boundaries. These population boundaries have been created for the first time for most of the populations. And uh, so we've got here the populations that are of interest for the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, but also the populations of that species for the rest of the world as well. So this draft population boundary portal has been quite an important way for us to communicate and share the draft boundaries and seek your feedback. Um, we'll come back to this later in terms of results. So if we start looking at the results, um, if we look at the total number, we can see that we are doing well for a lot of populations, but on the whole, for 12% 12 12 of the populations, we still do not have a reliable size estimate. And in terms of the others, we can say that 41 populations or 15% are census-based, 30% are based on expert opinion, and 43% are based on a best guess. So we've got uh, quite a different quality of information for the different populations. How does that look across the different families? Well, as we can expect, there's been a lot of good work on some families of birds or some populations of birds, and that is reflected in this uh, overall table. The lines here reflect the uh, proportion of populations for which we have either no estimate in dark blue, um, lighter blue uh, best guess, even lighter blue expert opinion, and the lightest census-based. So you can see that these populations are those that have census-based information. And the rally day, for example, stick out as a group for which there is poor information, or let's say no estimates. Moving on. If we look at the information in terms of size classes, we can see that there are 19% of populations for which we have information that are less than 10,000 individuals of birds. So these are, this is a large proportion of small populations of water birds in this flyway. And that means that they are a higher priority for conservation. Similarly, we've got uh, on balance, most of the populations between uh, uh, 25,000 to 100,000, that, that occupies about 60% uh, of the uh, populations. We have a small proportion of populations which have a large population estimate, 4% of them. And here again, you can see for 12%, we don't have that estimate at the moment. If we summarize that information, it's 17 populations for which we have uh, less than 1,000 individuals. And the smallest population is that of the Dalmatian pelican. This population, this species is more widespread globally from Europe to Asia, but the population of the East Asian Australasian um, area is only a very small population that breeds as far as we know in Western Mongolia and then spends the non-breeding period along the coast of mainland China. Um, we have, if we add up all the populations, that's 245 populations of the 272 populations of the partnership, we have about between four, 48 and 68 million individuals. So that's a large number of water birds that are dependent on this flyway. In this, if we add the sooty tern, which is a more marine species or the black leg kittiwake, you can see that these two populations themselves have nearly 20, uh, over 22 million water birds. 
So if we move on to, to the next slide, and that is the slide on, on trends, I'd like to invite uh, Tom to, to present here. Tom has been doing an amazing amount of work in pulling together the AWC and IWC database that holds all the information that we have been receiving through the annual Asian Waterbird Census for this region and uh, doing the technical statistical work that allows us to summarize this uh, report. So I, I really appreciate the help of Tom in all this work and leadership of Tom in all this work. And Tom, over to you. Thanks, H. So jumping into the trends, 116 populations are unknown or uncertain, 65 are declining, 51 stable, and only 44 increasing. Uh, if you can go to the next slide for me, Tage. Thank you. So if we look at the trends grouped by families, then 12 families have a majority of their populations declining or with an unknown uncertain trend. And that includes some of the larger families like the Laridae and the Scolopacidae, as well as families with single or few species. And that includes also the mask finfoot, which might be the most rapidly declining population in the flyway. There are only five families that have a majority of their populations either stable or increasing. Two of these only have a single population, but also the larger family of Anatidae, as well as Siconidae and Gruidae have generally favorable trends. There's also some individual population success, success stories in the Thriskionithidae, like the black-faced spoonbill, uh, uh, which is a species of special interest to the partnership to the working group, and the glossy ibis, which appears to be expanding its range. Uh, next slide, please, Dage. Thank you. As well as the trend direction, we also assess the quality of the trends, and we have four categories for that. No idea is when there is no monitoring at an international scale. Poor is when there is some international monitoring, but it is inadequate in quality or scope. Reasonable is when there is international monitoring that is able to track the direction of a trend. And good is when a trend can then be defined with statistical precision. Okay, next please, Tej. So for the AFP populations, 70% have poor or no idea quality trends. And only 30% of the populations, sorry, 30 populations, 11% have good trends. Yep, next please, Tage. Uh, again, assessing the quality of the trends for each family. Generally speaking, families with relatively high quality trends are the populations congregating in the non-breeding season. So these are often well covered either by the, the Asian waterbird census or other similar look-see surveys. Uh, secretive species, species congregating outside the non-breeding uh, the non-wintering season, non-breeding season, yeah, and more marine species generally have a lower quality trend. Okay, Tage. Thanks. This is quite an interesting slide. If we look at the current red list status of the EAF species, then 34 of the 216 species are listed as threatened and that's from representing 40 populations. So that means about three quarters of the species are considered least concern. But the IUCN red list classifies species least concern, least concern if they are assessed and do not qualify for another more threatened category. And what you'll also notice here is that none of the species are assessed as data deficient. So this means that the species with populations we've assessed as unknown or uncertain are very likely being assessed as least concern. And on top of that, whilst the species might actually be least concern at a global level, the population in this flyway could still be rapidly declining. 
So these are both important reasons why we need to improve the quality of the trend information in the future and ensure this information is supporting future red list assessments. Uh, next please, Tate. So this chart shows the decade for the start year of the trend. 68% of the populations have recent trends starting in the 2010s. And this is especially important for assessing populations in rapid short-term change. For the end year, we only included trends if they ended within the last 10 years. So that would be from 2011 onwards. Otherwise, we considered the data was too old to be reliable. Next, please, Teach. So a little bit of a look underneath the hood of the trend analyses. We put together a lot of different sources for assessing population trends. And one of the major sources we use is the Asian Waterbird Census. In total, the AWC data contributed to the assessment of 75 of the flyway populations. The results of all of the AWC population trend analysis are on the IWC website. I've put the link, it's very small, but it's in the bottom left corner. You can see the link uh, on this presentation. And in this presentation, we've got a couple of examples of the analyses. This one is the, are the results for Anis Kreka. So a congregatory species that can be well monitored by the AWC counts in January. The trend is dominated by data from the Republic of Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. You can see that in the chart in the bottom left, where you see the, the yellow, the pink, and the bottom light green from these regions. All of these data sets and Hong Kong are showing the same pattern of decline. You can see that in the chart in the top right, which are highlighted in red showing a very similar pattern. And what that means that it, we have some more confidence that the population is declining across its range because all of these regions are showing the same trend. However, an important gap and source of uncertainty in this particular trend is the Chinese mainland, where we only have good coverage in a few years from surveys, which I think are a collaborative effort of WWT, WWF and government partners. If you look at the bottom right chart, then you can see these high peaks of the darker green in some years. And this is maybe suggesting that perhaps a quarter or a third of the population could be in the Chinese mainland. So it's definitely an important gap for us to fill in the, for the future CSRs. And if you go to the next one, Tage. So this is an example of a population which we really can't monitor well under the AWC for painted snipe. It's a secretive and widespread species. And it's just very difficult to cover under any general water bird monitoring program. The numbers counted are very low and highly variable from year to year. So the results are just not at all reliable. However, at the moment, this is the only information we have for this population in the flyaway at the international scale. So there's nothing else we can use apart from this as a basis for uh, trend assessments. And I think, yeah, that's it, Tage, back to you. Thank you. So we've talked about what water birds are, water bird populations, <clears throat> and we've kept it a bit of secret as to what is the definition. So we thought it would be useful to place that definition when we are looking at the boundaries of these populations. And we follow a standard definition that the water bird population is a population of a species or a subspecies that is either geographically separated or discrete from other populations at all times of the year or at some times of the year only, or is a part of a a specified part of a contiguous continuous distribution of a population that is defined for the purposes of conservation management. So this definition allows us to be 
uh, clear on which area we are talking about for the conservation of that species at a population level. This is what the Ramsar Convention has used as a definition. This is what uh, the various flyway initiatives and agreements are using around the world. So we are consistently using what provides the basis for definition of a biological or a biogeographical population. All the CSR through an extensive consultation process that actually started in 2020 uh, when uh, Ching sent out information to all of you, we aim to prepare boundaries for all the populations. We were building on population boundaries that had been drafted and created uh, through various atlases and uh, projects in the past. And we had the good fortune of the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust pre preparing all the population boundaries for the Anatide as a start. We had population boundaries for cranes, we had population boundaries for several shorebirds, but we were missing the population boundaries for the bulk of the populations. So we drafted these based on the best information we had, and we can now say that the information is really of three qualities. Um, the first is it's for populations for which there is uh, poor information and it's uncertain what the boundaries are of the population during the breeding and or the non-breeding period. Secondly, we have a class of populations that are uh, those that we have basic information and that basic information is based on information from movement of marked birds, genetic studies, isotope studies or morphological differences of populations. And finally, we have uh, population boundaries for which we think there's the best confidence based on extensive data and knowledge about the distribution of the population during uh, the breeding and the non-breeding period, and is based on, again, a range of information sources. If we look at that, the class three or extensive knowledge comes from uh, or amounts to 26 populations or 9% of the populations. And this is mainly for populations of cranes, some anatidae and some shorebirds. Secondly, we've got 40 populations for which the information is based on basic information. And um, for 212, we've got very basic information. So you can see that uh, this is, uh, uh, this is quite variable information for distribution knowledge about populations. And so these are very basic maps that have been produced for some populations. I'd like to start with a few examples. Um, and here is the example of the bar-tailed godwit, one of the long distance migrants that in this flyway has three populations uh, and three subspecies even. These are uh, the yellow uh, line, which indicates the population of Bowerai. The, uh, sorry, the colors don't show up in the same way as we have here, have on the map. Uh, this orange, I should say, is Bowerai. The green is Anadarensis. And the yellow draft, uh, dashed line is of um, Mensberai. So we've got three populations that breed and migrate within the East Asian Australasian flyway. And they have largely distinct breeding areas, but they may have overlapping, partly overlapping non-breeding areas. The second is the bean goose that I'm providing an example for. And this is based on very good information that was recently published uh, on, a on a species that's quite complex because it, there are two population, two subspecies that breed in the area and migrate within the area and have quite uh, overlapping uh, uh, pathways of migration, but very clear differences 
when you separate them. And we are very glad that uh, Professor Chowle is on this call because this paper is one that she and many collaborators have brought together in good time for this uh, report. So based on this information, based on earlier publications, we have now got the boundaries for this population presented like this. So you've got six populations presented in different colors with the three populations that breed further south and three populations that breed further north. And in the, in the Annex 3 table and in the database, you can see for this species, you've got middendorphy, you've got cerirostris, and for each population, you've got the main breeding area, the non-breeding area, and information summarized on the population size, minimum and maximum. This may be the same for some species and populations. The quality indicator, as I explained, the trend information that Tom explained, the year from which the information started and ended, the code of uh, where or the trend uh, and its quality, uh, tr uh, quality code here. And you can see that even for one species like the, um, like the uh, uh, Middendorfi and Cerirostris populations, you've got quite a variety of information that we have used to generate the, the trends or this is published information. So the information is not equal across the different populations of the bean goose here. And this is the same for other species. If we jump forward, to other maps that are presented in the report. For the great white egret, we've got three populations, the northernmost breeding population, uh, a middle population, and a southern population. Again, these populations are partly overlapping, but these have distinct breeding areas as far as we know. For a population or a species like the rails for which we have very poor information on estimates, trends, the same is true for its boundaries. And this is the best we can draft at the moment for these uh, two populations. Here you can see that the population in Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia is part of a population that covers South Asia. For the black neck crane, Previously, it was considered as one species and population, but uh, from the review prepared in 2019, uh, by the, led by the International Crane Foundation, there are now three populations identified primarily based on the non-breeding range of these populations. For the little grebe, another poorly studied species <coughs> in terms of trends, this has a large widespread distribution. This is one subspecies. There are other subspecies across this region, some of which are non-migratory and therefore are not included in the partnership, but the maps of these are available on the website. And finally, a species, uh, the species which has uh, the largest number of individuals estimated for this region is one that has three populations within the flyway partnership region, one here in orange, one here in yellow, and one here in green, which has a much wider distribution. This is based on information uh, on uh, ring recoveries and movements across this region, but it's a species and population for which we would really encourage research for better information on its population delineation. This is an example of the website uh, where we had presented information and this is uh, information for the uh, beautiful uh, black nape tern. You can see that this population which straddles uh, a large part of the tropical part of the flyway, uh, the range is mentioned here, the non-breeding and breeding range is largely the same. Uh, although the, within this, you've got populations that are migrating. We have no information on the size. We have no information really on its trend. And therefore, 
these, these are also populations for which there needs to be more research. We are very glad that this year is the year of the turn uh, of the partnership, and we hope that that helps to promote more data collection and information that can feed into the next population um, uh, review. So now I think it's useful to look at the recommendations from this report because that really provides us a basis of looking forward. And in the report, we have uh, provided you a set of gaps and recommendations. The gaps obviously lead on to the recommendations for the purpose of this presentation. We focus on the recommendations. Uh, please do look at the details on gaps in the report as well. And uh, I think it's clear that the biggest recommendation is that we need to improve information on the size estimates and trends. And it's not a simple one-liner that we need to improve it. We really have gone into some of the details that how can we do that? Well, we need to really develop a more comprehensive flyway monitoring program covering all the EAFP populations. As you can see from the previous slides, we have many populations for which we have poor information or even no information. But monitoring waterbirds at a flyway scale means that we need to use a variety of techniques for different populations and species, depending on how easy or difficult it is to monitor them either in their breeding season or non-breeding season. So we, uh, we recognize that there are populations for which there is no information. So these are obviously a priority and for which there is no recent information. These are another priority. We need to develop a program of work in the partnership that allows the collection review of such information on a regular basis. And so we need data from populations that are best census during the breeding season. So these are breeding surveys for colonial species or species that are dis dispersed breeders. We need better surveys during the migration period for some populations that congregate at uh, bottlenecks which allow us to better census them at that time. For some species which are small populations or dispersed in certain areas, we need to focus attention. These are three species here, the great ragitant uh, threatened species, the black bellied tern and the river tern, which is probably limited to only a very small part of the uh, mainland of Southeast Asia now within the partnership area. We need separate uh, monitoring programs for secretive species. These include rails that are hidden in the reeds at all times or the snipes. And you saw the example that Tom provided of the trend information for the pintail snipe, which is not well covered during the uh, normal Asian waterbird census, or indeed most uh, look see surveys that are conducted during the non-breeding period because it's uh, a secretive species. We need special uh, efforts for populations that are outside wetlands. We know that several geese or ducks or uh, shorebirds may be found outside the wetlands. So besides monitoring wetlands, we need also efforts to cover these populations. We recognize that all the birds are not on land. And for populations that are offshore or inshore, we need to use boat or aerial surveys for such populations. So all this means we can't proceed unless we've got good guidance that has been called for by the uh, MOP decision 10.12. Uh, that means we need better guidance at the national level on standards for, uh, that are appropriate for different populations and for their monitoring. Moving on, um, we need to be able to strengthen monitoring efforts in each of the areas of the partnership and for these uh, ideally to be, developed, uh, to be included with the new guidelines that are being developed for the national partnerships and site-based partnerships so that 
the monitoring effort is really happening at the ground and is embedded better in the work of the partnership. We see that there is value in continuing the good efforts that are happening for the different populations and species through a variety of local monitoring programs, national monitoring programs, uh, sub-regional monitoring programs, and we really call on the partnership and the wider world to support and strengthen these ongoing efforts. We see that in order to generate the information needed to support the analysis of the type that has been done in this report, we would really benefit from more regular counts being done at all the sites of national and international importance across the flyway. It is a big ask, but if we are to get good and reliable information, we really need to have a step change in the way we can be implementing monitoring across the flyway. And this could be from regular counts. Once a year is regular, but ideally 12 times a year is also regular, which gives you much better information on how these sites are being used by the birds at different times of the year. And we already have over 150 uh, East Asian Australasian flyway network sites. These should be prioritized. We have Ramsar sites, we have World Heritage sites, and we have a large list of potentially uh, important sites that could be designated because they are nationally and internationally important. And these should be the focus of monitoring efforts into the future. We've recognized that there are geographic gaps and the, those are often because there is uh, low capacity. So there needs to be a lot of effort to build capacity, strengthen capacity. And I can reflect here that uh, the ASEAN uh, region has had, a re uh, has had a project that has focused on the ASEAN region to try and fill that geography gap. That kind of regional program and project needs to be uh, continued within that region as well as in the other regions. We need to maximize the impact of the ongoing uh, programs that the partnership has for the single species, because we know, as we've heard before, the black face spoonbill, for example, is a single monitoring uh, species uh, program. The spoonbill sandpiper is another species. And we need to ensure that the monitoring efforts through these projects and programs are also collecting information on all the water birds and contributing to the assessment of the wetlands at the same time. And importantly, that information is being fed to national partners for incorporation into their own databases, as well as into the Asian Water Bird Census database, which then allows for us at reviews like this to make that information part of the uh, assessments and trend work. Finally, we need to look ahead at how can we use different kinds of information that we may not be using at the moment to extrapolate from monitoring uh, surveys and um, analysis that allow for getting good information through innovative measures, uh, me methods. We see the need for the development of a stronger partnership of organizations with expertise internationally and nationally to work together to support this flyway monitoring program and the development of strong national guidance uh, in the coming years. And this is something we see as the biggest takeaway message from this review and we'd be very keen to talk with partners and experts on how can we make this a reality in the coming years. We've spoken with the Flyway Partnership Secretariat on the need for trying to find a way to make this happen and we'd like to follow up with partners after this uh, report is, is out. Next, um, why is the slide stuck? Okay, next is that we need to improve, as we've seen, the information on the biogeographic populations, and that we need a strong process of updating this on a regular basis. And as I mentioned earlier, for including populations of the uh, seabird related families 
uh, in future CSRs that were not covered in this. We need to ensure that this remains a priority of research uh, for populations for which we have limited information. So we call on the research community to step up their research and um, continue this work. And you can see from your work that it is contributing very well to information on distribution, on species uh, size estimates and trends. So we call on you to continue this work. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have a portal where this information will become available. During the consultation process for the population boundaries, we had uh, information on a separate portal and the current water bird population portal really has a blank at the moment. So through this review, you have all contributed to the global update and for a population like Northern Pintail, which is really across the world, this uh, review contributes to the improvement of this boundary map and therefore contributes to the global uh, review uh, and documentation as well. Again, we know that the quality of these maps can be improved, so we call on you to help in that process. And finally, the internal process of the CSR to make sure that we have uh, the best way to take these reviews forward on a regular basis is that we must ensure that we have a predictable cycle of updates because that ensures familiarity of the process. It helps us to establish a new routine for both data collection and for data analysis and for experts to contribute to that consultation process when the reviews are being conducted. This review was the first time, it was a big learning process for us all within this flyway. We have benefited from the process that has been established in the African Eurasian region. And we've now got the eighth review uh, that was produced in that flyway. So there's been a lot of learning within these eight uh, review cycles for that flyway. And we are fortunate to be able to learn from that process and jumpstart how we can improve um, updating reviews in the future within our flyway. So what we've called for in this report is that the review could be produced every three years if possible, because that is in line with reviews for the other flyways to feed into the global updates as well. And this is in line with the Ramsar Convention's call for a, re a report to be provided to every meeting of parties of the Ramsar Convention. This does not happen at the moment on a regular basis because we do not have the various uh, flyway mechanisms to make this global update every three years. So we hope that if the, within the EAFP, we are able to follow a three-year cycle that contributes to this global process as well. If not, uh, at, at least we should be producing the report every four years or every uh, alternate mop. But as we know that the mops may be delayed, the meeting of parties, uh, partners in this flyway has been delayed now three years. So there is a danger of linking it to a meeting. So it should be a regular process that continues separate to the meetings if we are to have the latest information available for the benefit of conservation. The secondly, uh, we should look at improved ways of how we can use the existing working groups and task force within the partnership uh, mechanism for the CSR developments. How can we strengthen their role? How can we mandate them to be implementing these reviews in a more structured manner that ensures that they themselves can reach out to the partners and experts in all the countries in the flyway and collect the best information, the latest information, so that the quality of the CSR reports can be improved in the future. And we can deal with populations which are just not covered at the moment. Finally, the partnership may wish to consider setting up working groups to cover the taxonomic gaps that uh, are existing within the partnership at the moment to contribute to these future reviews or to be finding other ways 
and working with existing working groups and expert groups out there to try and fill the gaps in the meantime. I think with that, we've come to an end of this review. I'd like to, uh, on behalf of Tom and myself, really acknowledge all the strong support we've received over the last uh, two years now for this work, the preparatory work from 2020 onwards, the main work during 2021 and now into 2022 from the science unit and Ching for her support and help and leadership in the consultation work, the EFP partners, the working groups and task forces. Many of uh, you are in this uh, meeting, so we're very glad that you're here. I'd like to thank you all. We would like to thank you all. The specialist groups, the Asian Waterbird Census Coordinators and the many experts out there who've contributed to this report. The chair, Nick Davidson of the technical subcommittee who has been a strong supporter, ally and someone who's shoved us forward to make sure that things are happening on time. A number of interns and volunteers who've helped to prepare the boundary maps and helped in many different ways. The flyway secretariat led by Doug Watkins and his team in providing us the financial resources for this work, as well as the valuable contribution from the Norwegian Environment Agency for the funding they have provided. Not last, uh, but and least is the support we received from the, um, e, uh, from the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi uh, for their support to produce the portal where all this information is being made available in its final form as well. The last point is to mention at the bottom is the link to where you can download all the draft documents if you've not had a chance to look at them as yet. So thank you very much. And uh, Doug, I can, uh, I can say we've ended this presentation for now. Over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Tej and Tom, uh, for for this presentation. It, it's very good to get this overview um, because there's now so much more to uh, the population estimates process, uh, and I think in particular developing the the distribution polygons for populations is particularly valuable and something that uh, can be much <clears throat> more refined now that, there's a, that, that there is a polygon for people to, uh, to argue about. <laughs> so um, that, uh, that's a very uh, 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 strong step forward for, for the population estimates for the, the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And also I think uh, there, this, uh, this uh, process has had much more analysis of information as well. Um, and really uh, searching out um, stronger ways that we can, we can work up the existing data. Um, we've had uh, uh, a range of comments um, through, through the, the chat. Um, mostly they are, are addressing specific points rather than asking questions. So I could, I could quickly go through um, and, uh, and uh, I, I've sort of grouped the, the comments in the way that in the, in uh, some people have given a number of comments and so I'll run through them. So Simba Chan has um, uh, put in several notes. Um, one, um, he, uh, he considers there's more information on Dalmatian pelican to, to update um, and uh, to update the uh, population estimate. Um, secondly, uh, Simba makes a point that that for the snipe, uh, and I think other very uh, cryptic uh, um, uh, uh, rouses snipe, then uh, he mentions the need to work with bird banding schemes. So I think that's um, uh, trying to, you know, re needing to actually have banding studies to try and work out more what's happening with, uh, with snipe. Um, there is now uh, the Asian seabird uh, colony register has been has been started, and so Simba suggests he, that that in the future we'll be able to inform more on uh, 
um, the population estimates and, and broader information about uh, the, the seabirds in, in our flyway. Um, also, he makes the point that uh, one of the areas that we're, we're, we're perhaps missing information is in, in non-English publications. Um, and uh, that is something that I would hope that our proposed national partnerships uh, could actually assist with, um, because that would be a very valuable way that the, the national um, national partner, uh, the national partnership uh, could contribute back into the into this uh, process. Um, moving on, um, Dingley uh, uh, talks uh, mentions about several colonial species in Indo-Burma, which seem to be undergoing population increases and range expansion. Uh, an example is darters, cormorants, and open bills. And he would be uh, interested uh, in what the trends uh, are based on, uh, based on standard censuses look like. So do you have any comment, Tejon? on the changes in the populations of darters, cormorants, and open bills. Um, perhaps there was data from, from Bangladesh and Myanmar. It's a question for you, Tej. Sorry, Doug. I thought you were going through all the comments and then we'd come back to them, but uh, happy to take this one first. <clears throat> yes. So uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for your feedback. And thanks, uh, Dingli, for this specific question. Uh, indeed, uh, we see that for the Asian open bill, the population seems to be expanding and moving southwards uh, all the way to your home in Singapore and across the, uh, the straits to Sumatra. Uh, we, have, uh, we have therefore uh, drawn a much bigger boundary and in fact had useful feedback uh, with for, uh, colleagues in Sumatra and elsewhere to redraw this boundary. Uh, in, in the final version of the uh, population uh, boundary that will be made available on the website. So yes, uh, we understand that populations are uh, expanding, um, but for a population like the data, we've not got very good information or cormorants as well uh, in terms of um, census data that help to understand what's going on. And these are populations that probably are better counted at colonies rather than during the non-breeding season because uh, they are, um, they being colonial, they are easier to count when they congregate at that time of year. Otherwise, many of them are spread out widely in canals, ponds, rivers, uh, and are more difficult to census. Okay. Uh Sort of leading on from that one, uh, we've had a, a, a question from Devan Mita, um, and he, he, the question is, what's the current status of waterbirds in Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspots? Generally, that portion has not, not had sufficient data or, or proper data analysis. So um, perhaps you can comment on, um, on the EAFP review in relation to um, populations in Bangladesh and, and Myanmar, or particularly Bangladesh. And maybe, uh, Doug, I could invite, uh, if with your permission, Nick, uh, to respond on that because he has been leading some very interesting work in that region. I better put my hand down. I was going to. Thank you, Sage. <coughs> Yes, um, just to note that Bangladesh is not within the Indo-Burma hotspot. Okay. Uh, it is primarily Myanmar, okay. Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, and oh, well, it goes into parts of southern China. Um, currently, we are in the process of preparing an Indo-Burma wetland outlook um, for the Indo-Burma Ramsar Regional Initiative. Um, it will be published later this year by IUCN, who are the secretariat to the initiative. Uh, this includes a whole range of indicators of different aspects of biodiversity threats, pressures, and responses. Uh, one of those is an indicator on water bird population trends, which draws on the CSR1 updated data, particularly for migratory species. Um, I'll just, in passing, note that. 
because the Flyway Partnership is for migratory water birds, we still have a big problem with out-of-date population estimates for resident species, which is something that I think it's a bit hard to add into the recommendations to, to the Flyway Partnership, but I think it should be picked up in there as something else that needs to be done in terms of um, identifying 1% um, thresholds for resident um, populations, uh, particularly for Ramsar site designation. Um, the indicator on water bird population trends in the weapon outlook for Indo-Burma um, suggests, and I, I replied with a personal message uh, to Devon, um, currently is showing about 47% of populations for which there is a trend are in decline and far fewer are increasing. Now, this is not an analysis of count data from only sites in the Indo-Burma region. It is <clears throat> for those populations in the WPE and CSR that, that occur in, depend on the Indo-Burma region. So that's the best we can do. We don't have good um, data, I think, to look at only sites of the, where uh, counts from only sites in the Indo-Burma region where these species occur. But watch this space. The wetland outlook should be published later this year by IUCN, um, and it will include uh, this indicator. But it suggests that in the Indo-Burma region, the information we have is that more populations are in trouble than are improving. Uh, and it also identifies that picking up a point that Tage and uh, Tom made about the relationship between our biogeographic population scale estimates and the IUCN red list, which is at the species level. And in the Indo-Verma region, I think it is only 16% of species on the red list are assessed as globally threatened. But as we've seen, at a biogeographic population level, we have a far higher uh, number of declining populations. And that's why at the, bi the biogeographic population level is so important for actually understanding better about what is actually going on in the region. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, uh Vivian, perhaps can I have some guidance about whether we can talk more or do we need to go to, um, to Rob? Uh, yeah, am I audible to all of you? Uh, yes, uh, please. Yeah, yeah Devin here uh, from India. Uh, I asked this question to all of you because uh, I was uh, assuming that uh, several northeastern states of India also uh, are part of East Asian flyways. And uh, generally, those places are not aware about data collection uh, due to lots of social as well as ecological uh, limitations. And some factors are also there that uh, people are not aware about bird watching and bird monitoring. Education is also a part uh, that people are more into humanities and arts in that part. I worked in that part, uh, two states. One is Nagaland and one is Meghalaya. So based on my observation, I just wanted to know about uh, what are the key factors also? So uh, thanks, Nick. You uh, thanks to Nick that he has shared his uh, data and observations. And uh, I just wanted to uh, add one more thing in my question: that what are the key factors that are stopping us to get data from such uh, some such locations? What are the factors? Happy to answer that. Um, thank you, for, uh, Devin. Uh, the point you make about Northeast India uh, is the same as the contiguous area of Myanmar, where access is difficult, where numbers of people who have the skills and capacity to do the monitoring are limited, and language is an issue, communication is an issue. So there are a variety of reasons for which there are gaps in our knowledge on the status of populations across the flyway. Um, in this, uh, uh, within the partnership, we have over the last uh, decade and more aimed to promote improved data monitoring at sites, 
Uh, we've recognized that there are more than a thousand sites of international importance for migratory waterbirds. Uh, and as uh, Nick mentioned before, there are many more sites of importance for uh, resident populations. And so the task we have at hand is quite large. The population of the numbers of people who are involved in this work are uh, more limited. And so we would like to see how can we in a smart way fill in geographic gaps, strengthen the local capacity to collect this information share this information, review the information for their own purposes and to be able to contribute it to uh, national level projects and flyway level projects. <coughs> this comes back also to the point that uh, Simba had made before that this review may have um, not accessed all the local language publications. I'm sure it hasn't because no review can. At the flyway level, we have depended on flyway working groups and task forces. And the real value and strength of these task forces and working groups is to reach out in a cascade to their national networks, to their local networks, to provide the information in local language into such reviews. Um, we are fortunate that many publications have found their way back into this review. And we are very grateful to the people who have made available those uh, local language publications for the review. We are sure that there are many that have not gotten to the review, but we can only do as much as we can based on the information that the working groups and task forces can do in supporting such reviews. So I hope that, uh, as was one of the recommendations for this, uh, from this review, that we are able to strengthen the input and hand and participation of the task forces and working groups. Future reviews will be able to access in a timely manner data in different countries, in different languages, publications, both published and unpublished. There's a lot of gray literature out there, project reports which contain nuggets of information which never get published. So how can we strengthen the network of researchers and contributors to such future reviews should be a question for us to follow up after this, uh, after this meeting, working with the partnership, working with the mechanisms that we have within the partnership and look at other ways of filling the gaps. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Tej. Um, are there any other questions people would like to put to uh, to Tage? And if not, um, if yeah, if I might, this yeah. is yeah, yeah. Rob. Uh, yes, um, I, I I'm just so impressed with what you've pulled together, Tage and Tom. Thank you so much. Um, and, and here in the state of Alaska in the United States, we think of biogeography, uh, abundance and distribution. And then there's monitoring, which is that that's the next level. Um, and so when you talk about monthly counts, you know, and, and, and finding resources to do that effort, you know, that's really anyways, I, I think you've done a wonderful job. And I, I really appreciate, in particular, the, um, the summary in terms of recommendations, you know, the four the four slides that you've provided, how, how we in the flyway can maybe step up and improve that information. But again, that the biogeography, and, and that's part of the, like the seabird, um, like an Asian seabird colony register. Um, and that's really abundance and distribution. And then when you drill down where you actually have people doing, as you propose, like a monthly count, and that's the monitoring, that's where you're getting population trends. So um, to me, those are uh, two different steps. And, and um, you know, ideally we have, population trends, and that's exactly what this effort is. Um, but then there's also just that that kind of maybe not as refined level of information, but abundance and distribution. Um, but uh, yeah, wonderful job. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, Tej, is there uh, something more you would like to say in relation to, um, to the lead up to MOP? We will 
uh, cover some of that a little bit later, but um, is there any more comments from Wetlands International? Sure. Um, so, um, as was mentioned before, uh, we are trying to produce this as a benchmark with the available information. And we have gone with involvement of everyone through a very extensive and intensive consultation. And we have information that we've now collated. Um, before this meeting back in March, Ching has sent out the final report, which we've now presented. We've consulted with some of the groups on specific issues. The, there are outstanding issues that we need to resolve. And we can see from the chat that there's interest to provide new information. Uh, but we have to have an endpoint to this report in order to proceed. And so we would like to uh, call for any feedback, additional feedback on the specifics that help us to clarify issues related to either the distribution boundary maps or the population estimates or the trends. Recognizing that any information uh, can contribute a small element, but it may not change necessarily the outcome of the uh, assessment. It is still important to provide that information. So this is a call for any information you'd like to provide. We'd like to be able to process that uh, feedback and to incorporate it in the final version of the report. The report, as was mentioned earlier, was one that would be produced according to the timeline that the Secretariat had given Wetlands International to be out by the middle of this year. We are doing well in terms of the overall timeline, and we hope that if we are able to uh, finalize, get your feedback, that is of the world uh, at large, uh, on this report by the 18th of May, and that would be the hard deadline after that, we cannot incorporate any more changes. We would, from the 18th and 19th onwards, review the changes, finalize the report, and submit that to the secretariat. The secretariat then hands that over to the technical subcommittee for their final sign-off and review. And once that's done, the review is completed and dusted. As a process, uh, the... Um, uh, the management committee will look at it and uh, sign off on it. And we hope that that's done also within the month of June, so that by the middle of June, we can make the information available publicly accessible. I think that is the priority because everybody is asking us on a regular basis, where is this report? Why is it behind a, a login? Make it available publicly. Well, we would like to make it available publicly as soon as the technical subcommittee has signed off on it. So um, I hope within the month of June, we can have public access to the um, population estimates, trends, 1%, as well as all the boundaries that would be on the waterbird populations portal. In addition to those documents, uh, in addition to the maps and uh, database being available on the portal, the final version of the report itself, the summary report we presented, would be uploaded on the Flyway Partnership website, as well as on the website of Wetlands International. And we then call this review to a close. But it's important that for the, uh, for the process of the conservation status review, that a process paper is forwarded, submitted to the next meeting of partners, which happens next year. So uh, this is the sort of timeline that we see taking things forward. And we'd like to work with all of you to make sure that we can meet those uh, timelines. Thank you, uh, Doug. Okay, um, could I invite <clears throat> Nick to, uh, to say a few words? I see he's, he's asking for the floor. Um, Yes, thank you. Just very briefly, a couple of points. Um, one is, I, I, I know a number of the technical subcommittee members are on this call, um, and uh, I hope they're as appreciative as I am of what Tage and Tom have achieved and produced for us. Uh, and yes, we will um, look for a, a sign-off, uh, final sign-off by the technical subcommittee who've had the draft report previously for any comments, um, and we will send that out as a, a 
request for approval and sign off um, in the coming weeks as and when Paige tells us he's ready. Um, and I will, it will be on the basis that it's a last opportunity to make any further comments. And I will set a timeline for response from the technical subcommittee and will take no response as a tackled approval by that deadline. Just one other thought occurred to me, and I should have picked it up earlier on, and it's maybe something to look at putting into the recommendations. And that relates to what I said at one point I made at the start. We have now a considerable number of changed different population size estimates from previously, and hence different changed 1% thresholds some of which may be higher because of an increase in population, many of which may be lower. It would therefore be appropriate to undertake a review and update of populations qualifying for designation as a flyway network site for each of the designated flyway network sites, because it is highly likely that the um, basis on which populations have been included as qualifying with 1% thresholds for fly, many flyway network sites will now be different and it could well be there are more populations qualifying. So I would put a recommendation, suggest putting a rec perhaps a recommendation in the report which then goes forward to more um, uh, to call for um, each party who has designated flyway network sites to review the qualification on the basis of the new thresholds in the conservation status review. Now Ramsar has adopted, although it's not complied with, a update of Ramsar information sheets not longer than every six years, i.e. every two Ramsar cycles, but I'm not sure that that provision is in any of the decisions from MOPs and that's something maybe we should look at for the future, taking to the next MOP in relation to recommendations for the application of the CSR. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Nick. Um, one, one moment. <clears throat> um, perhaps now uh, we really uh, will ask uh, uh, Rob to, to uh, provide some closing remarks. Are we there already? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, I uh, I'm super impressed. Thank you so much, Tage and Tom, the Secretariat. Oh, I should perhaps introduce myself. <laughs> uh, I am the chair of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. I'm also the chair of the Seabird Working Group uh, for the East Asian Australasian Flyway, uh, with my. Um, very handy and useful and wonderful. Um, Simba Chan has done great work and, and Tung as well. So, um, but yes, uh, I'm super impressed. This is amazing. I know, um, so I'm from Alaska, the United States. I'm the US representative to the Flyway Partnership. And um, we have a, a, a term, um, perhaps it's universal, but um, herding the cats and I think Tage has just done an amazing job herding the cats, trying to get the, this information pulled together. Um, and, and there is a lot of information gaps, um, including the quality of the information. And so I know a lot of the information that's being pulled together, sometimes there's, um, it's not great, but you, you make do with what you do have. And uh, Tage and Tom have done a wonderful job you quantify that, um, and if the quality isn't great, well, you still have to push forward and make a decision. But they've done a great job pushing forward, pushing the, the working groups, the technical committees forward, and um, making sure that there's a, uh, an information, information available for the 1% um, thresholds that we need for the Flyway Network site and uh, identify, identify and um, the nomination of those sites. And that's something that I think is, and perhaps it's not the right word to use or the term, but the crown jewel, I think, of the flyway site network is, is our, or sorry, the, the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership is these um, network sites. Um, we're gonna look forward to 
uh, nominating more sites. I think the, the Secretariat has done an amazing job on that, but we really rely on uh, Ramsar convention de definitions and um, uh, Wetlands International to really help us pull together all the information. So as I had mentioned maybe earlier in my comments about in terms of biogeography, you know, where are the birds? Um, and whether, you know, we've, you know, from a seabird perspective, we've talked about um, water birds, but now we've kind of expanded the water bird definition to include seabirds. So a little bit offshore as well. So something that I'm very grateful to the, the flyway to include. Um, and uh, as we move forward, just very grateful, knowing that there is information gaps and how we might be able to, to improve that. Um, I encourage all of us to review the, the report that, that Tage and Tom have pulled together. And then um, the, four, the last four slides that, that Tage and Tom had for recommendations and how we can improve this effort. So, um, and with that, I'm just grateful for everybody's level of engagement and um, pulling together information that sometimes is sparse and really uh, identifying that there are a lot of gaps and limitations, but in particular that these gaps can only be addressed by strengthening our existing monitoring programs, uh, establishing new monitoring programs where we can and improving the system and the procedures to pull this information together. So. Again, a big thanks to, to Tage and Tom and, and the Secretariat. So with that, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, particularly to uh, Wetlands International for all of the work they've done. You know, this is a huge task um, and particularly this step, because in this step, um, it has expanded uh, from what the, uh, the previous um, population estimates processes have done. But, but these have been very important uh, um, expansion of the work to, to really deliver us a much better um, data set from the, from, from the review. Um, we, uh, there'll be still uh, uh, work to, 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 uh, to consider for the, particularly the technical subcommittee to consider the report um, and to bring, uh, bring, bring this to, to the mop. Uh, and I'm sure at MOP there'll be uh, quite a bit more discussion about the process really and how we can improve the process in the future. Um, and we will uh, be um, putting to the MOP the adoption of uh, national partnership models um, to build more uh, coordination within each country um, and provide a mechanism that can bring together the information um, in each country to feed back into the, uh, the flyway partnership. Um, so if that is uh, adopted, um, we hope it will be a, a very uh, strong mechanism for um, enhancing the flyway partnership um, within each countries. And it uh, may be able to, to um, also look at the, the flyway network site issue at, at a national, uh, at a national um, level. Um, and you know, deal with this difficult issue of updating information about the site, the network sites, but also having a stronger link to the sites and mobilising more uh, monitoring of, of water birds um, through this through this national mechanism in each country. So thank you very much to to Wetlands International, to um, to to Nick and to Rob. Um, and thank you to all of the people that have joined this, this webinar to uh, continue the, the journey towards MOP um, in relation to these uh, updated population estimates. Um, I welcome uh, any comments. So, so we have until the 18th of May to f provide your in input or forever hold your peace. <laughs> you know, you can bring it back next time, the next time this process starts, <laughs> if you haven't got it in on that by the yeah. 18th, because it, it will it will miss the boat. Yes, thank you. Just uh, just from our side, um, 
to say that uh, we are fortunate that uh, having launched this consultation process for the final review since, a, uh, since March, we have uh, now a chance to close this review and uh, remembering that this is a benchmark and the information needs to be out there for people to use. And as uh, Rob mentioned, uh, the recommendations provide a basis for follow-up so that the next CSR report can benefit from strengthened monitoring of the existing populations, but also to be covering the gaps um, for species and populations that are not covered well during the annual monitoring programs, but require special attention. So we hope that um, monitoring can continue and be strengthened for looking at population trends as well as, as you mentioned, other information that's needed on abundance and distribution should continue. The research on migration should continue because the satellite tracking, the geolocators, the color flagging, the uh, isotope studies are telling us so much about, so much new stuff about the distribution of populations. This has been critical for delineation of the population boundaries. And as you saw, this is uh, good for some populations, but there are many holes. And we hope that these maps and boundaries can be improved, the estimates can be improved, the trends can be improved. It's not easy work. And from the bottom of my heart, I really want to thank everybody involved in this, in the field, in the cold, in the sun, in the rain, who are doing the counting, sending in the information and making such reviews possible. It's a pleasure to work with you all and thank you so much. We hope that uh, we can meet the deadlines and you can have the information available. As Nick mentioned, it is so important that we can use this information for looking at the existing network sites. What does the information mean in terms of increased populations or decreased populations? What does that mean in terms of the other sites that need to be designated? Because we have, uh, with poor information, overlook their importance. And unless we have a network of good connectivity across the flyway for every population, we cannot stop or reduce the decline of populations, let alone see their increase. So I hope that this information really provides a bedrock for change uh, that needs to be happening in every place. Please let's hope that you can all respond by email one email only, wpe.wetlands.org for all your responses so that it's not lost in the, in, the, in the emails of different people. I'll put that down again here um, on the chat. So you have wpe.wetlands.org as the address for uh, all your feedback. Uh, please uh, share any documents you have that can support it. Uh, your, your suggestions for change because we don't have time to follow up on emails to ask you for this information. So you've seen now in this report, how do we document information in the notes with references? Unless we have that, it's very difficult to use your valuable information. So please help us, particularly at this critical endpoint, to provide the information in a form that we can include in the report. Thank you all. And thank you, Doug, and the Partnership Secretariat, Rob and Nick, in this uh, important webinar. Thank you very much. Um, any, um, any comments that people wish to make just before we close? That being the case, um, the, um, the, uh, this is also will be available on, on, um, on um, Facebook, um, so we, we will have it um, on your message. Um, okay, um, so this will be up on uh, on the website so that uh, people can uh, review this again um, at their at their at any time. Thank you yeah, much. It, Thank you very much. It, yeah, it looked like Vivian uh, okay, Vivian good. said that there is going to be a YouTube, like maybe a, a YouTube link that could be shared as well. So that would be great. Okay, so in the chat, Vivian put the um, Facebook. the in, in the chat. She's got the Facebook address for the webinar. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank 
Thank you, Tage. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Nick. Great.